Hi, I'm Rachel Jacobson. I am a lead scientist at Spring Discovery, and I am going to walk you through our inflammasome drug discovery program. Our inflammasome program is a collaboration between our biologists and our engineers, and we've worked together to design experiments and develop analytical tools to understand the complexities of inflammasome biology. I'm gonna start with a brief introduction of inflammasomes, what they are and why we care about them. Then I'm gonna discuss how our team worked together to develop our tools that we've used to understand the complexities of these biological pathways. And finally, I'll describe how we use those tools to screen for and identify novel drugs that we can hopefully use to treat many of the human diseases that are associated with dysregulated inflammasome pathways. Introduction on inflammasome biology. There are multiple inflammasome complexes and pathways, but fundamentally, the inflammasome is a multi-protein complex that is assembled through some activation stimulus. The inflammasome complex then acts as a functional protease or protein scissors that cleaves and activates proteins that are then released from the cell to amplify the inflammatory signal. Regardless of the pathway or the inflammasome complex, there are two pro-inflammatory cytokines known as IL-1 beta and IL-18 that are required to drive this amplification process. An expression of these proteins is achieved through something called a priming step, which you'll see on the left-hand side of this schematic. On the right side of the schematic, we look at the activation steps that can drive the different inflammasome pathways. There are multiple different complexes that can form from a variety of different inflammasome activation stimuli. Ultimately, these all converge on a complex formation, which is denoted by these pinwheel-looking cartoons on this right-hand side of the schematic. Complex assembly converges at this point and results in an activated caspase-1. So caspase-1 is this protein scissors or protease. The caspase 1 then cleaves and activates our pro inflammatory cytokines, IL 1 beta and IL 18, as well as a poor forming protein known as gastermin D. Now, gastermin D is responsible for facilitating the release of IL 1 beta and IL 18 outside of the cell, and it does this by forming a pore on the outside of the cell. This pore formation is also critical and is the terminal step of a cell death program called pyrotosis. So pyrotosis is an inflammasome-mediated cell death. It is a highly inflammatory death. The word literally means fiery death. This is a highly inflammatory process that's part of our innate immune response and serves as a defense mechanism when our bodies are introduced to stresses or pathogens. It's critical for our host defense, but it's also a process that if it becomes dysregulated can lead to human disease. Um, and in fact, it has been dysregulation of these pathways has been linked to a variety of human diseases, some acute, like acute respir respiratory distress syndrome, and some that are more chronic, such as rheumatoid arthritis. Because of all of our links between inflammasome biology, dysregulation, and human disease, a lot of companies in the pharmaceutical and biotech spaces are heavily invested in understanding and targeting these pathways. For the most part, these companies have been looking at NLRP3 specifically, which is a logical target. NLRP3 is one of the main inflammasome complexes, is a convergence point of multiple activation stimuli. It makes a lot of sense to go after this as a target, but it is a bit limiting in view because there's a lot more complex biology going on here. Because of that, at Spring, we're interested in applying our machine learning platforms to build analytical tools to help us identify states of inflammasome activation and inhibition by using all of the complexities of these biological pathways. Our ultimate goal here would be to identify multiple novel inhibitors from a single screen and then use that screen to drive multiple clinical paths forward. To do this, we optimized different activation conditions that drive different inflammasome complex assemblies. So here on the slide, you'll see that there are five different activation stimuli that we troubleshot and designed in experiments to understand various inflammasome pathways. The first is MDP, which drives NLRP1 inflammasome activation. We also have flagellin driving NLRC4 inflammasome activation, and we have three different stimuli to drive NLRP3 inflammasome activation. So we also wanted to use control inhibitors so we could understand states of inflammasome inhibition in addition to activation. And this is really important because activation and basal cells lie at two ends of a spectrum, and inhibition can lie anywhere in between those two ends, depending on where in a pathway we are inhibiting. So we use control inhibitors that are shown here in red, whose mechanisms of action are at these various stages of inflammasome activation. Once we established our experimental parameters to capture our various states of inflammasome activation and inhibition, we then developed and honed our analytical tool set using a mixture of targeted and unbiased approaches. 
So to develop our program, we used a combination of proteomic and imaging data that was taken from activated human immune cells. So these were primary immune cells taken from human blood and isolated into what we call PBMCs. The PBMCs were then plated onto 384 well plates and activated using our array of inflammasome activators or inhibitors. Samples were collected for proteomic analysis from the supernatants of the cells. And we also used dyes and stains to stain the cells so that we could understand the morphologies of the cells themselves as well as their subcellular components. The cells were then imaged and analyzed using a series of targeted and unbiased approaches that I'll describe in the next few slides. The resulting data was then organized into Megamap, and this is our custom-built software that we use to visualize our data and score compounds based on hundreds of different features. All of the features that we're measuring are collected from each well. So each well, each sample, can be analyzed for hundreds of different features. Um, in the Megamap, so looking over at the right side of the slide, Every column here represents one of these different features. Every row represents a different sample or compounds that we've tested. And the color of the squares, so the red and the green, indicate the direction of change relative to a control. So we have a huge amount of data here in Megamap, and then we are also able to design scores that we can weight the different features according to the kind of compounds that we're interested in and looking for. All of the features that make up the columns in Megamap are derived from three different types of analyses, all of which are measured, again, from these individual wells. The first set of features that we look at is ASD specs. This is a quantification. It's a well-validated measure of inflammasome activation, and it serves kind of as our benchmark of our tooling and of our experimental design. Then we have targeted features. And these these are built across multiple programs. These are using our cell stains, our image analysis, and our proteomic analysis. And then finally, we have built our black box model signatures. So these are our unbiased machine learning models that we can use to distinguish the various inflammasome activation and inhibition states. And again, I just want to reiterate, all of these features are derived from every well in a 384 well plate. So we're able to get a huge amount of information from just one small well. So the first class of features that we're going to talk about now is around our ASD specs. So ASD is a protein that is incorporated into inflammasome complexes, and it is easily stained using immunofluorescence techniques. It is a well-validated measure of inflammasome activation, and it is one that we've used as a benchmark for our methods. What you're looking at in this slide here is an image of human PBMCs that have been stained using our various dyes and stains, and also with ASC. And what you see in the inset is a cell that's been activated We're using ATP, and we see a small spec, which is our ASC spec. This is indicating that the cell was activated with ATP. On the right side of the slide, we're looking at a quantification of the ASC spec. This is just one of the quantifications that we have around ASC specs. This one in particular is looking at the average percentage of cells that are positive for ASC spec, so cells that have an ASC spec present on them. You can see in the vehicle column, so the first purple bar here, that cells that are activated for ATP have a high percentage of positivity. Whereas cells that have been treated with our control inflammasome inhibitors, which are the following three bars to the right of that vehicle control, have a statistically significant decrease in the number of cells that have an ASD spec. So that indicates that our inhibitors are blocking inflammasome activation. So altogether, this is showing us that we have good control of our system. We can activate and inhibit inflammasomes in human PBMCs. Moving into our targeted features, we've discovered different classes of cells that are associated with different inflammasome states using unsupervised algorithms. So I'm just showing you three different clusters here of these different classes, and we have many more that we could talk about, but for the sake of time, we're just going to go through these three. Each set of four images here is representative of a different cluster. On the very left side of the slide, our first cluster, these are basal monocytes. So these are cells that are associated with inactivated cells. You can see in the quantification below, in the red DMSO column, unactivated cells have a high percentage of cells that fall into this cluster. ATP activation significantly reduces the number of cells that are identified in this cluster, and then inhibition of that ATP activation restores the levels back to what we saw in the basal state. The middle cluster is representative monocytes that are activated and undergo part of 
pyrotosis but have not completed pyrotosis. And we call these aborted non-pyrototic monocytes. On the quantification below, we can see in the DMSO basal cells that very few cells fall into this cluster. ATP activation drives the percentages of cells that fall into this cluster up, and inhibition drives it back down to the basal levels. Now, this cluster is really interesting because if we have an inhibitor of gastromin D, which again is that terminal pore forming step at the end of pyrotosis, if we inhibit that step, we actually see a huge enrichment in the number of cells that fall into this cluster. So if we're looking for gastromin D inhibitors, for example, we can weight this particular feature very heavily to find inhibitors that would be blocking that terminal step. The last cluster on this slide is looking at terminal pyrotosis. So these are monocytes that have undergone the entire inflammasome activation and death process. Again, we see this trend where in unactivated cells, we have very low percentage of cells that fall into this class. ATP activation drives that up and inhibition drives it back down. We also have at our disposal a series of targeted features that have been built across multiple programs and that are at our disposal to draw correlations with various activation and inhibition states. This is just a sampling of some of our targeted features that I'm going to go through. Um, we have examples of cell death so we can quantify the ways the cells can die. We also have quantifications around mitochondrial dynamics, so understanding the membrane potential, the metabolism of the cell and also the reticular or fragmented nature of the mitochondrial networks. We have measures that can give us an understanding of nuclear morphology. So these are ones that would give us the shape and size of the nucleus relative to the rest of the cell. We also have quantifications around cell composition. And these are really important because we're working with PBMCs, which is a heterogeneous group of cells. And we have ways to distinguish what types of cells we're looking at in each image. That also gives us the power to use these other features on cell type specific analysis. So to complement our imaging data, we can also measure changes in the secreted proteomes from the exact same cells that we image. This is accomplished using high dimensional proteomic analysis as seen here. This visualization that you're looking at is multidimensional data plotted in a two-dimensional space, and it demonstrates that we can resolve differences between activation and inactivation as well as inhibition. So what you're looking at in the purple circle here is ATP activated PBMC. So this is a total profile of 40 different cytokines. They cluster together. In the upper fuchsia colored circle, we have non-activated cells. And what you can see with our inhibitors, so we have two here, we have MCC950 and A804598. Both of these inhibitors are shifting the cytokine profile from the ATP activated profile to a non-ATP activated state. And this is in a dose dependent manner, which is indicated by the size of the circles here. So the smallest circles you'll see more clustered around with this ATP activated state and the larger circles are gonna be moving up towards the non-activated state. We also have the capacity to zoom in on a specific cytokine so we can look at that proto profile of the cytokine across different concentrations in a more traditional way. In addition to our targeted analyses, we have also built unbiased black box models around our various inflammasome activation and inhibition states. So looking at the right-hand side of the slide, this is a confusion matrix that shows that we can accurately distinguish between different activation stimuli with high confidence. We can similarly resolve inhibition states using our control inhibitors. And this gives us really powerful tools that we can use to resolve the complexities of inflammasome biology that we were originally seeking out. So now focusing in on the ATP and flagellin activation, we can show clear differences between activated state and inactivated states. So using our two-dimensional visualization of multidimensional data, we can see that the non-activated cells in fuchsia fall to the bottom right of this plot, whereas our activated cells are in the upper left side. And then we have flagellin activation on the left side of the slide and ATP activation on the right side of the slide. And then throwing in our inhibitor, we can see the specificity of our clustering analysis here. So what we see, again, using these two-dimensional graph plots is that non-activated cells on the flagellin activation side fall on the bottom right side of this plot. Our flagellin activated cells are up on the left side and our inhibited cells using an ATP-specific inhibitor do nothing under flagellin activation, which is what we would expect from this particular inhibitor. But then looking at the right side of the slide at the ATP activation, we see that our inhibited cells fall now with the non-activated cells, which is showing our specificity of this inhibitor to completely block ATP activation in human PBMCs. So to recap, at Spring, we've developed a set of, of analytical tools to measure many different cell behaviors from a single well. We have our inflammasome-specific quantifications around ASC spec formation. We have targeted imaging and proteomic features that we have at our disposal to use and weight as we see fit for different types of compounds. We have our activation and inhibition-specific signatures that are based on our unbiased models. And just to reiterate for like the 10th time, all of these features are analyzed from every single well. So we have a huge amount of data that's available to us 
as we're moving through our drug compound screening. I'm going to walk you through now how we designed our screen to identify novel inflammasome inhibitors using this toolkit that I just described to you. So we've just discussed the tools that we've built and how we can study inflammasome biology, including all of the complexities involved and not just focusing in on a single target. So now I'm going to discuss how we designed our screening process to identify novel inhibitors. So to do this, we chose two of our activation conditions. We chose ATP and flagellin. We subjected human PBMCs to these activation conditions and used high-throughput imaging of our cells and then all of our analytical tools or feature analysis and proteomic analysis to identify top compound hits. We then used downstream orthogonal assays that we designed to assign mechanisms of action to classes of compounds. These classes could then be optimally matched to specific and relevant human conditions. So from one screen, we were driving several clinical programs forward. So as I mentioned, we used our screen to identify different compound classes, and we really wanted to bucket these into five unique mechanisms of action. The first of these was looking at that priming step. So again, this is looking at expression of IL-1 beta and IL-18, which are the pro-inflammatory cytokines that can drive the amplification of inflammasome signaling. The second bucket of compound inhibitors would be those that can block the activation stimulus. So these would be very pathway-specific inhibitors that block very specific stimuli. The third bucket of compounds would be ones that can affect inflammasome complex formation. So this could affect NLRP1, NLRP3, or NLRC4. Our fourth class of compounds would come after a convergence point of all of the inflammasome mechanisms. So this would be the CAS phase 1 activation step where we're looking at cleavage of IL-1 beta, IL-18, and gastrin D. And the last class of compounds that we'd be looking at are ones that can inhibit that gastrin D pore formation. So this would be the terminal step of inflammasome activation and pyrotosis. Moving on to how our data actually look in the screen, this is a lot of information here. This is a screenshot of our mega map, just looking at a fraction of what we actually have. And this is just showing you a small list of compounds that we identified, looking at a handful of the features that are inflammasome relevant. It's not really important exactly everything that you're looking at on the screen, but I want you to notice that we have a ranking of compounds based on scores that we've assigned based on the features that are here. Looking a little more closely at one particular compound we identified is called SC13745. We identified this compound as a strong ATP specific inhibitor. So this was a compound where we scored very high on ATP activation, but did nothing under the flagellin state. This compound was then moved into downstream orthogonal assay development to understand better its mechanism of action. The first orthogonal assay that we looked at was an experiment that we call the multi-activation validation assay. So this is looking at all of the different activation stimuli that we developed at spring. So not just the two that we used on the screen, but looking at all of the ones that we've developed. Each row here is a different activation condition. The first set of features that we looked at was ASD spec formation. We have a box here indicating broad acting inflammasome inhibitor. So this is the purple box. The yellow box below is our compound of interest to so the SC13745. And just to notice the difference here, we see a lot of dark squares, which is in indicating significant differences across all of these different rows for our broad acting inflammasome inhibitor. So that would indicate that this is something that can affect all of the conditions. Whereas our SC13475 is only really showing some significance on the top row, which is ATP condition. Next, we're looking at ATP-specific signatures. So these are features associated with our black box modeling. We can again see that our broad-acting inflammasome inhibitor has significant change here in the purple box. Our yellow box is showing significant change with our SC13745. When we add in the other inflammasome activators, we see significant changes across the board with our broad-acting inflammasome inhibitor, which is, again, expected. This is something that we know blocks the terminal step of pyrotosis, and so we know and expect that it would block all of these activation conditions. Our SC13745, however, really only has an effect in that first set of features around ATP and does nothing under the under other activation conditions, indicating that this compound is very likely very specific to ATP activation of inflammasomes. The next assay that we tested was a death classification assay. So this is what we affectionately call death buckets in our lab. And this is really looking at different types of cell death following ATP or flagellin activation on activated human monocytes, and then treating these different activation states with our various compound hits. We used Anexin 5 and Cytox staining with automated analysis to understand the different death pathways that might be activated here. So an XM5 alone staining with our nuclear stain would indicate an apoptosis mediated cell death. An XM5 combined with a cytox green stain would indicate either pyrotosis or necrosis. 
whereas a nuclear stain only is our live cells. So the ideal compound, we would see an increase in alive cells with an increase in compound concentration and a decrease in death. And that's exactly what we see under the ATP activation condition with our compound of interest, SC13745. We see an increase in the percentage of cells that are alive and a corresponding decrease in the number of cells that are dying. We don't see any change in the number of cells that are apoptotic. So we're not seeing any shift in the type of death that these cells might be undergoing. On the flagellin graph to the right, we see no change at all, which again is expected given a, the nature of this compounds being specific for ATP activation. So looking at the supernatants from those exact same wells that we did the death bucket analysis, we also measured proteomic analysis. So this was looking specifically at IL-1 beta on the left side of the cell. So IL-1 beta, again, is one of those pro-inflammatory cytokines that's released following inflammasome activation. We see that SC13745 dose-dependently decreases the amount of IL-1 beta found in the supernatants of these monocytes that were activated with ATP. Then looking at the right-hand side of the slide, we're looking again at one of these two-dimensional plots of our multidimensional data. So looking at an entire profile of 40 different cytokines, we see this shift from activated cells, which are the purple cells circled at the bottom, towards the non-activated cells, which is the fuchsia cells highlighted at the top in a dose-dependent manner. So again, the small circles indicate low doses of our compound, which are clustered more with the activated cells, and the larger circles denote our higher concentration of this compound, moving everything back towards that non-activated state. So altogether, these data showed us that we found an ATP-specific compound that was safe and that does not kill the cells through apoptosis or some other mechanism. So this was pretty exciting data. This was just a small piece of the data that we found. We identified over 300 candidates out of 12,000 compounds screened that we advanced into these downstream analyses. Of those, we were able to classify them into, according to our different classes of mechanisms of action that can be matched to a variety of different human indications. We identified seven targets, so compounds that, I, that hit specific protein targets that we can match and use to move forward into different clinical programs. So with that, I'd like to thank our entire spring team, our engineers and our biologists all worked really hard in a very collaborative manner to be able to understand this really complex biology. Thank you so much.